Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. History, Literature and Storytelling in the Great Khan's Tent is now available on YouTube. You can find us using this podcast name. Fear not, listeners, episodes will still be released on this podcast first, and it is only after a delay of a week that I will upload them onto YouTube. You can still find us on all your podcast providers first. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. In this series, you may hear a sound in the middle of the narration like this. This is just a little informative sound to let you, the listener, know that an important footnote will be provided to help in the understanding of a certain concept or expand on what was discussed. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. Thank you for listening, and now, on with the show. Welcome to a new series from In the Great Khan's Tent. Fear not, listeners, we will be continuing the 1001 Nights shortly, but wanted to take this podcast in a new direction under our directive to educate people. What better way to do so than to look at one of the overlooked areas of history the later balls. Thus, I present you with In the Great Khan's Tent presents the later balls. We begin this series with the death of the last great Mughal, Aurangzeb, and see the struggles that began for the control of the Mughal Empire. We also encounter the repercussions of Aurangzeb's rise to power and how his suspicious nature shaped this coming conflict. We are introduced to, in this episode, by three principal players, Aurangzeb's surviving sons, Muhammad Muazim, Azim Shah, and Muhammad Ghan Baksh, and their offspring. We are also introduced to the notables who will play an increasingly important role as we continue this series, and how they began to play kingmaker and competing for both eminence and power. We hope that you enjoy this series as much as you enjoy the 1001 Nights. And once again, I would like to reiterate that we will continue where we have left off with that series shortly. Thank you for always listening to us. Chapter 1. Bahadur Shah Section 1. Death of Alamgir, His Children After an illness of a few days, Alamgir died in his camp at Ahmadnagar on the 28th Zul Qada, 1118 after Hijra, corresponding to the 3rd of March, 1707, new style in the 91st lunar year of his age and the 51st of his reign. The actual place of his death is probably denoted by the Barahdari, Aurangzeb's tomb, 
marked on the map between pages 688 and 689 in Bombay Gazetteer, Volume 17. The place lies two miles northeast of Amanagar town. Alamgir had five sons and five daughters. The dates concerning them are taken mostly from the Masiri Alamgiri, tarikh e muhammadi and Abdul Hamid's Badshah Nama, with corrections by J. Sarkar. The eldest son, Muhammad Sultan, was born near Mathura on the 4th Ramzan 1049, 30th December 1639, and died on the 7th Shawal 1087, 14th December 1676, in the 39th year of his age, and in the 20th year of his father's reign, he left no issue. The fourth son it will only be necessary to mention. His name was Akbar. He was born on the 11th Zulhijra, 1067, 21st September 1657, and after rebelling and joining the Rajputs in 1681, he fled first to the Maharata court of Zambaji and hence to Persia. He died at Mashhad on the 31st of March, 1706. This date is given by the Tarikh i Muhammadi, but according to the Masiri Alamgiri, pages 483 and 537, Akbar died in 1704. The date of his birth is given as the 11th of Zulhijjah by Kambu and as the 12th by Masir, a later compilation. At the emperor's death, there thus remained only three claimants for the throne, his second, third, and fifth sons. The second son, Muhammad Muazim, was born at Burhanpur in the Dakin on the 30th Rajab, 1053, 14th October, 1643. His mother and the mother of the eldest son, Muhammad Sultan, was Nawab Bai, daughter of Raja Raju, Raja of Rajuri in Kashmir. She died at Delhi in 1691. Muhammad Azam, the third son, was born of Dilras Banu Begum, daughter of Shah Nawaz Khan Safawi on the 12th Shaban 1063, 9th July 1653. He is usually styled Ali Jah and often Azam Tara. The fifth and last son, Muhammad Kam Baksh, was born on 10th Ramzan 1077, 7th March 1677. His mother was Bai Udapuri, who died at Gwalior in June 1707, a few days after the defeat of Azam Shah by Bahadur Shah. Of Alamgir's daughter, the eldest was Zabun Nisa Begum, born on the 10th Shawal 1047, 26 February 1637. The Masir-i Alamgiri wrongly gives the year as 1048 after Hijra. Abdul Hamid's Padshah Nama gives the correct figure 1047 after Hijra. She died at Delhi, a state prisoner, in 1702, unmarried. She used to write poetry under the name of Makhfi, or The Hidden. The second daughter was Zinat Old Nisa Begum, born on the first Sheban, 1053, 16th October, 1643, her mother being the daughter of Shah Nawaz Khan. She took an active interest in the cause of her full brother, Azam Shah, and after his defeat refused to be reconciled to Bahadur Shah, he conferred on her the title of Padshah Begum and sent her to end her days in Delhi. She died there on the 18th May, 1721, at the age of 80 years. Badr un Nisa Begum, the third in order, was born of Nawab Bai on the 29th Shawal, 1057, 28th November, 1647. She died on 20th Zulkada, 1080, 20th April, 1670, in the 13th year of the reign. The fourth daughter, Zubdat Unnisa Begum, was born on the 26th Ramzan, 1061, 13th September, 1651. She died on the 17th of February, 
1707, less than a month before her father. She had been married to her cousin, Sipihir Shuko, son of Prince Dara Shuko, by whom she had a son, Ali Tabar, who died a six-month-old infant at the end of 1676. Meher Unnisa Begum, the fifth daughter, was born of Aurangabadi Mahal on the 3rd Safar, 1072, 26th September 1661. She was married to Izad Bakhsh, son of Prince Murad Bakhsh, and died on the 18th Zulhijjah, 1117, 1st April 1706, a year before her father. Muhammad Muazzam, Shah Alam. After the imprisonment and death of his elder brother, Sultan Muhammad, the second son, Muhammad Muazzam became heir apparent. The latter, in the early part of his father's reign from 1664, was actively employed in the Dakhan against the Marathas and the Muslim kingdom of Bijapur. In 1683-1684, he commanded an army in the Khan Khan without much success and then served under his father at the siege of Golconda. Aurangzeb's suspicious nature is sufficiently notorious, and his intrigues against his father had prepared him to expect a similar conduct on part of his own children. More than 20 years before this period, Muhammad Muazzam had been suspected of intriguing for power at the time of his father's temporary illness. During the siege of Golconda, some communication passed between Abul Hassan, the ruler of that place, and the prince. These messages referred to a proposed intercession for peace to be made through Muhammad Muazzam. Arn Zeb assumed that they were of a disloyal nature and at once placed his son under arrest 4th of March 1687. The story of his Konkan expedition and arrest is told with references to authorities in Sarkar's History of Aurangzeb, Volume 4, Chapter 44 and 47. The story of the relaxation of his capacity is in Kafi Khan. Muhammad Muazzam was kept a prisoner for nearly seven years during the whole of which time he behaved with the utmost discretion, showing throughout the most complete outward humility and resignation. After applying various tests, Alamgir readmitted his son to partial favor. His two eldest sons, Muizuddin and Muhammad Azim, were released and appointed to commands. In 1695, Muhammad Muazzam, styled in his father's lifetime, Shah Alam, was himself released, and on the 9th of Shawwal, 1106, 24th May 1695, sent as a governor to Akbarabad. He passed one year up to 24th July 1696 in Agra, proceeding hence to Lahore, Multan, and Uch. On the death of Amir Khan, the Subadar of Kabul, he assumed the government of that province, reaching the city of Kabul on the 4th June 1699, after a march by the way of Jahang, Peshawar, the Khaibar Pass, Jalalabad, and Jagdalak. For eight years, the hot season was spent in Kabul and the cold weather at Jalalabad or Peshawar or in marches throughout the country. On the 25th of November 1706, he pitched his camp at Jamrud, 12 miles west of Peshawar, and he was still there when he heard first of the illness and then the death of his father at Ahmadagar in the Dakhan. The prince's two young sons, Rafi ul Qadr and Hujista Akhtar, were then with him. The eldest, Muizuddin, was at Multan and the second, Muhammad Azim, on his way from his government in Bihar to his grandfather's camp in the Dakhan. Jagji Vandas, Folios 37-51 to The earlier dates have been corrected by a reference to official history Masiri Alamgiri, pages 373, 382, and 374. Azim Shah
Alamgir's second surviving son, Azam Shah, had for many years looked on himself as his father's destined successor. It may be surmised that he was not altogether without his share in the intrigues which led Alamgir to distrust and at length imprison the elder son, Muhammad Muazzam. In any case, Azam Shah used the opportunity offered by his brother's long removal from power to increase his own authority and influence. In 1701, he was appointed to the government of Ahmadabad, Gujarat, and sent to administer that province in person. There, he acquired considerable wealth and increased the numbers of his armed force. In 1706, his father reluctantly permitted him to return to the imperial headquarters, the prince's eldest son, Bidar Bakht, being transferred from Malwa to Ahmedabad as his father's deputy. It was not long before quarrels arose between Azam Shah and his younger brother Muhammad Khan Bakhsh. His jealousy was also aroused by the independent position and the rumored wealth of Prince Muhammad Azim, second son of Muhammad Muazim, who had been a subedar of Bengal and Bihar for some years. One of Alamgir's last acts was to recall this grandson from Azimabad Patna at the instigation of Muhammad Azam. As we shall see presently, this very act turned out to have a most disastrous influence upon Azam Shah's own future. Muhammad Kam Baksh Alamgir had felt that his end was approaching and he foresaw that if his two sons Azam Shah and Kam Baksh were left together, his death would be the signal for instant hostilities. The Maharathas were at the time giving great trouble in the vicinity of the imperial camp, and any dispute among the claimants to the crown would provide them with an opportunity of which they would not be slow to avail themselves. Further, as is usual with fathers, Alamgir was fonder of his younger than his other sons. Kam Baksh was therefore appointed to be the Subedar of Bijapur and on the 16th February 1707 set out for the south with Hasam Khan, Mir Malang, who had been recently named as his chief advisor, accompanied by a large body of Mughal troops under the command of one of their chief men, Muhammad Amin Khan. Kam Bakhsht was directed to march to his destination with all possible expedition. A few days afterwards, Azam Shah was told by his father that his deputy in Malwa was not capable of suppressing the disturbances in that province. He must proceed to it in person. Mace-bearers with strict orders were deputed to urge on his departure. He left the imperial quarters on the 22nd February 1707 and marched northward, but without making very rapid progress. In four marches, he had only reached the bank of the river Godavari, about 40 miles from his father's camp. Alamgir's Will The story goes that Alamgir left a will with directions for his own burial and for the partition of the empire between his three sons. It is said that it was found by Hamiduddin Khan, head of the household, under the emperor's pillow. Kafi Khan, Volume 2, page 549. Kamwar Khan, a copy of the will, had reached Surat as early as 18th October 1707. Valentine, Volume 4, page 274. The will making a partition of the empire and alleged to have been found under his pillow after his death is given in British Museum, additional 18.881, folio 76b, and Indian Office Library, manuscript 1344, folio 49b. A different one containing directions about his burial and instructions for his successor is given in Hamiduddin's Akram e Alamgiri, text edited by me with an English translation by Juganesh Sarkar. As the terms of the will accord with the measures taken by the emperor given his three sons the provinces 
that he had assigned to them in his lifetime, it may be assumed to be authentic. Its terms were also appealed to afterwards by Muhammad Muazzam Bahadur Shah when he wrote to his brother Azam Shah offering him a compromise. This will is a little vague, but its substance may be thus stated. It entreats his successors to leave Kambaksh unmolested, should he content himself with the two new provinces, that is Bijapur and Hyderabad. Amir ul Umrah, that is Asad Khan, his vizier, is recommended as vizier. Of the two capitals, Agra and Delhi, one should be taken by each son. The city of Agra should go to the province belonging to it, the Dakin Subas, Malwa and Ahmadabad, Gujarat, and with the city of Delhi, the country of Kabul and all remaining provinces. There is an injunction to be true and faithful to Azam Shah, and this seems to conflict somewhat with the supposed impartiality of the testament. But as Azam Shah, in spite of this declaration in his favor, declined to be bound by other provisions of the will, the suspicion that he might have drawn up the document for his own benefit must fall to the ground. Taking the provinces and their revenues in Dam, 40 to the rupee, as stated by James Fraser. Nadir Shah, page 34. A translation of the will is given on pages 36-37 of this book. The Persian text is also contained in Fraser Manuscript 118, Bodleian number 1923, folio 13a. The proposed distribution would have given the following results. Bahadur Shah, 12 subas, worth 5,175,956,440 dam. Azim Shah, 6 subas, worth 4,704,255,400 dam. And Kam Baksh, 2 subas worth 2,191,665,000 dam for a grand total of 20 subas worth 12,071,876,840 dam section 2 measures taken on alamgir's death As soon as the emperor had breathed his last, the vizier Asad Khan, known as Amir ul Umrah, sent for all the nobles. He bound them by oaths to act in union, while Sarbara Khan, the Kotwal or officer in charge of the camp police, was sent out to preserve order. Meanwhile, the Qazi ul Qazat, with other learned and holy men, prepared the body for the tomb. Letters were sent in all haste to Prince Azam Shah by Asad Khan and by the prince's sister Zinat ul Nisa requesting him to return without a moment's delay. On the second night after the emperor's death, Azam Shah arrived accompanied by a few of his chief men. He was met and escorted in by all the nobles except Asad Khan and Hamid ul Din Khan who were engaged within the imperial enclosure. Gulal Bar, in guarding the corpse and performing ceremonies of mourning. The nobles proffered the usual condolences and congratulations. Azam Shah wept when he first saw his father's corpse, and in the presence of such old and faithful servants as Hamid din Khan and Amir Khan, called aloud his father's name like the poor do when they mourn. On the 6th March, 1707, the body was sent off in charge of Hamid ul Din Khan to Dalatabad, about 10 miles northwest of Aurangabad, and there buried as Alamgir had requested in the courtyard surrounding the tomb of the saint Sheikh Zain ul Haq, Azam Shah assisting to carry the bear as far as the principal entrance of the camp. The tomb is about 4 miles west of Dalatabad. It has a platform of red stone 3 ghaz long and two and a half ghaz wide. The place was named Kul Dabad, 
and Bahadur Shah allotted several villages yielding a revenue of 50,000 rupees a year from Parganas in Sarkar Dalatabad for the feeding of the poor and other expenses. In 1121, these villages were formed into new Pargana called Kuldabad. The funeral ceremonies being completed and the first days of mourning having elapsed, Azam Shah on the 10th Zul 1118, 14th March 1707, the Eid uz Zuha, ascended the throne with the usual ceremonial. In the tent used as a public audience hall, a pulpit was erected, whereas Sheikh Abdul Khalik read the khutbah or public prayer for the sovereign's welfare in the name of Azam Shah by the style and title of Abul Fayaz. Kutubuddin Muhammad Azam Shah Ghazi, the chief officials and commanders, nearly all of whom were present with the late emperor in camp, submitted to Azam Shah in a body. Some were really attached to him, such as Mutalib Khan, Tarbiyat Khan, Amanatullah Khan, and some others. The rest were indifferent. The leader of the Mughals, however, a very important and influential body, held aloof. Ghaziuddin Khan Firuz Jung, then Subadar of Berar, and his son Chin Kilich Khan afterwards, Nizam al Mulk, evaded taking part in the approaching campaign, while Muhammad Azim Khan, cousin of Firuz Jung, although he deserted Khan Bakhsh and started for Hindustan with Azim Shah, did not proceed further than a stage or two beyond Burhanpur and hence returned to the Dakhan. Azam Shah was in reality angry at Khan Firuz Jung's refusal to march with him, but thought it wisest to disassemble, and at the chief's request appointed him to the charge of the Aurangabad province and his son Chin Kilich Khan to that of Burhanpur. One story is that when Zulfikar Khan joined near Aurangabad, Azam Shah asked him for advice. Leave your wives and families at Dalatabad as Alamgir did, replied Zulfikar Khan, and give them money for the expenditure of two months. Do not march by the pass of Fardapur, but by that of Diwal Khat, thus giving Khan Firuz Jung a chance of joining. The prince, in his usual haughty way, said if there was a real enemy in front, it would be right to leave his family behind but Muazim's character was well known. He was not another Dara Shukho. His Muazim Shah's own special troops were sufficient. Those of the late emperor were of no use except to shout Mubarak and Salamat. Why should he leave his direct road for sake of obtaining the aid of a blind man? Khan Firoz Jung had been totally blind for 20 years. From the beginning, great dissatisfaction was caused by the prince's refusal to give promotion or grants of money. A great number of personal favorites, new and untried men, were brought into the service much to the disgust of the older officers. The late emperor's vizier even, Asad Khan, was so pressed by his soldiers for their pay. During the last decade of Aurangzeb's reign, his soldiers' pay used to be usually in arrears for three years. That it was only by a loan of a lakh of rupees from Chin Kilich Khan that he was able to appease them. As Asad Khan and his son Zulfikar Khan at Alamgir's death away on duty in the south beyond the Krishna play a principal part in Azim Shah's contest for sovereignty and continue to be important personages until the ascension of Muhammad Farooq Siyar. It will be well to give here some account of them. Asad Khan, Muhammad Ibrahim, was a son of Zulfikar Khan Karamanlu, who took refuge in India from the enmity of the sovereign of Iran. Asad Khan was born about 1631 and entered the imperial service in the 27th year of Shah Jahan, 1654. In Alamgir's reign, he was long second Bakshi, then deputy of the vizier from the 13th year, 1670, and in the 19th year, 1676, was himself made vizier. From the 27th year, 1684, he served continually in the Dakin. His son, Zulfikar Khan, Muhammad Ismail, was born in 1657. His mother, being Mehrun Nisa Begum, 
daughter of Asaf Khan, Yamin ud He was thus highly connected on the mother's side. He received his first appointment on the 11th year of Alamgir, 1668, and in 1677 married the daughter of Shaista Khan, the Amir ul-Umrah. At the same time, he received the title of Iktikad Khan. In 1689 AD, as a reward for taking the fort of Rahiri, and along with it the sons of Shamba Maharata and his whole family, he was made Zulfikar Khan. In 1698, he took the Maharata stronghold of Jinji and was made Nusra Jung, and in 1702, he succeeded Bahramand Khan as Mir Bakshi. His last service had been the bringing of reinforcements in 1705 when Alamgir was so oppressed during the siege of Wakin Khera Fort, which was held by Prayakh Naik. But envious tongues raised doubts in Alamgir's suspicious mind by repeating the gossip of the camp and quoting in allusion to Zulfikar Khan's title, saying, There is no young man like Ali and no sword like Zulfikar. To counteract this supposed preeminence, Alamgir forthwith began to promote nobles of the Turani party. But at the emperor's death, these two men, Asad Khan and Zulfikar Khan, were incontestably the first in the empire, both in rank and influence. They threw their lot in with Azam Shah. Muhammad Khan Bakhsh and his movements. As already stated, Khan Bakhsh had marched for Bijapur a short time before his father's death. His escort consisted of Mughal troops under the command of Muhammad Amin Khan and others. The prince had not gone beyond Parinda, about 75 miles southeast of Ahmednagar, when he heard of his father's death. The Mughal leaders and their men left him without asking his permission and returned to Ahmednagar to join Azam Shah. This led to the plunder of much of the prince's baggage. In great disorder, he hastened on till he was within sight of Bijapur. For seven days, Sayyid Niaz Khan, nephew and deputy of, of the late Subradar Chin Kilich Khan, kept the fort gates closed and made difficulties about delivering possession. After two weeks, a settlement was come to and Niaz Khan gave up the fort. The prince took up his quarters within it. Some say that while the prince was still encamped outside Bijapur, Zulfikar Khan Nusrat Jang, who had been in pursuit of the Maharatas and was only a few miles away on hearing of Alamgir's death, conceived the project of capturing Khan Bakhsh and delivering him to Azam Shah. There was an old quarrel between Prince Khan Bakhsh and Zulfikar Khan dating from the time of the Siege of Jinji in the year 1693. The idea was only abandoned in deference to the advice of Rao Dalpat Bundela, an old and experienced man highly esteemed by Zulfikar Khan. The Khan resumed his march and joined Azam Shah, and that prince, though so much stronger, did not interfere with his younger brother's independence. By some accounts, Kam Bakhsh wished to join his brother but his offer was refused. Meanwhile, Kam Bakhsh assumed all the attributes of independent sovereignty, granted rank, mansab, and titles, khitab, appointed a minister and other chief officers of state, assumed the regal title of Din Pana, defender of the faith, and coined money in his own name. Section 3. Azam Shah's March to Hindustan After his enthronement, Azam Shah issued coins with the inscription Sikha Zad Dar Jahan Ba Dalat O Jahan Bad Shah I Mamalik Azam Shah. Coin was struck in the world with fortune and dignity by the emperor of the kingdoms Azam Shah. Some advised that Kam Bakhsh pretension should be first dealt with. Azam Shah held the enterprise of Muazam Shah to be threatening even though this rival could hardly require more than a stick to beat him. A number of appointments and promotions were made before leaving Ahmadagar. On the 17th March 1707, 
the advance tents were sent on, and on the 2nd of April, after 11 days march and 5 days of halt, Aurangabad had been reached. Much of the many stores and many of the artificers were left behind at Aurangabad. One day's rest was taken, the tombs of Alamgir, the prince's father, of his mother and of the saint Burhan Uddin were visited and a short prayer Fatiha recited at each. On the 3rd April 1707, the march was resumed, and on the 24th April, the army arrived at Burhanpur, having covered 56 and a half khos in 18 marches with four halts. At Aurangabad, the prince was joined by Zulfikar Khan and Tarbiyat Khan, former Mir Atash, or the commander of artillery, who before the late emperor's death had been sent to drive away the Maharatas. Rao Dalpat Bundela, Rao Ram Singh Hada, and other of the officers serving under these generals were presented. But from the manner in which things were conducted, Zulfikar Khan refrained in great measure from any interference in public business. In fact, he and his father, Asad Khan, had done their best to persuade Azim Khan to leave them behind in the Dakin, while Chin Kilich Khan, on the pretext that his presence was required in his new governments of Aurangabad and Khandesh, quitted the army. Azim Shah left Burhanpur on the 25th of April, and instead of the usual and open route by the Akbarpur ferry on the Narmada, he bore to the right and adopted as being shorter the more difficult road across Padhar to the Tomri Pass. Tumri in Bhopal state, about 16 miles north of Nimrawar, which is opposite Handia on the Narmada. Long, narrow, and entirely waterless. In the two marches through the pass, numbers of the poor men and women died from want of water. Grain was also very dear, and it was with difficulty that a bullock skin of muddy water could be procured, even at the price of 15 rupees. Further confusion arose from the withdrawal of Muhammad Amin Khan and all his troops while the army was passing through the defile under the supervision of Rao Dalpat Bundela. It was reported to Azim Shah as soon as he had reached Pandhar, a place six coasts from Burhanpur, that the men of Muhammad Amin Khan, who was in command of the rear guard, had commenced to plunder the stragglers. A great outcry was raised in the prince's presence by the tradespeople and poorer camp followers. Azam Shah became very angry, sent for Muhammad Amin Khan, and addressed him in strong language. Muhammad Amin Khan made excuses at the time, and he was left in charge of the rear guard. It had been obvious from the first that he was not hearty in the cause. He had acted without vigor and had betrayed ill will whenever he dared. The next day, when the army had reached the village of Daud Nagar, Muhammad Amin Khan loitered six or seven miles in the rear of the column, and hence without leave or notice turned and made off for Burhanpur. He was followed by many of the soldiers raised in the Dakhan. On his way, he plundered the convoy of supplies coming from Burhanpur. Many offers to pursue the fugitive were made, but all were rejected owing to Azim Shah's eagerness to press on. All that he said was, He who is coming, let him come, and he who is not coming, let him stay away. Our trust is in the master and not in his slaves. Hushal Chand, Manuscript Folio 366b Some said that the true reason for this desertion was that Azim Shah had given up the prayers of the Jamaat. He had fallen under suspicion of being a Shia. The accusation of heredoxy seems to have had some truth in it. Kush Hal Chand attributes the change to the influence of one Muhammad Amin Khan, the prince's librarian, probably identical with Mir Muhammad Amin Sharaf Khan, a learned man and confidant of Azam, killed at Jajau. tarikh e muhammadi half of his army was made up of Shias. Mirza Muhammad says, Azim Shah was suspected of being a Shia, for this caused men of Mahawa Anar, 
Nay, all the Sunnis objected to his succession, although he had jurat and halk e adalat on which sovereignty is founded. But it is hardly necessary to search for any special explanation of Muhammad Amin Khan's conduct. It was, no doubt, governed entirely then, as always, by a regard for his own interest. During the whole of this time, no word had reached Azam Shah as to the plans or movement of his elder brother, Muhammad Muazim. Azam Shah made up his mind, however, before he had left Burhanpur that he would make for Agra. At the time, the reasons for so doing must have seemed very weighty. The Subadar of Agra, Mukhtar Khan, was father-in-law to Bidar Bakht, the prince's eldest son, while Baki Khan, commander of the fortress, and Ali Shir, the kotwal or police officer of the city, were both known to be favorable to the prince. In the fortress of Agra were stored the accumulation of several reigns, and whoever could first possess himself of these was likely to overcome his opponent, for neither side had the means of their own for carrying on a long campaign. Bidar Bakht, the eldest son of Azam Shah, was at Ahmedabad when he heard of his grandfather's death. He wrote at once to his father proposing with his approval to raise troops and march by way of Ajmer straight to Agra and bar the road of the opposite side. At first Azam Shah assented and sent a farman to his son under the style of Bidar Shah. Abdullah Khan, deputy governor of Malwa, who had a large force, was ordered to join the prince. On receipt of the farman, Bidar Bakht raised 2,000 men, conferred robes of honor upon his chief men as his father had directed, while Wazarat Khan, his diwan, distributed money to the troops. The prince then started from Ahmedabad. Unfortunately, Azim Shah was jealous of his elder son and had long suspected him of plots for his, Azim Shah's, superstition. This feeling had been intensified by one of the last acts of Alamgir. Annoyed at the overbearing conduct of Azim Shah, Alamgir, as soon as Azim Shah had departed for Malwa, wrote a letter in his own hand to his grandson, Bidar Bakht, then at Ahmedabad, complaining that Azam Shah had given as much trouble as he ought to have given assistance. Bidar Bakht must, he wrote, make the greatest possible haste to headquarters. This letter was received when Bidar Bakht was in the Jama Masjid of Ahmedabad. In obedience here through, he marched four or five miles out of Ahmedabad and then wrote a reply to that effect to his grandfather. This reply fell into Azim Shah's hands when he took possession of his father's property. The estrangement between father and son was now greater than ever. As a proverb says, an enemy inside the house is worse than one outside. Wallah Jah, Azim Shah's second son, proposed to his father the capture of Agra, where all the treasures of the empire were buried. It was hinted that Bidar Bakht, if he obtained the start, might on reaching Agra take possession of all the treasure and turn his arms against his father. Fresh orders were therefore issued to him. He was now ordered not to enlist men but to join his father at Gwalior. Bidar Bakht, although he lamented the evil advice his father had received, disbanded his troops and started to join his father. He reached Shah Jahanpur in Malwa on the 5th April 1707. In this neighborhood, as that of Ujjain, he waited one month and twenty days for the arrival of Azam Shah. On the way, he had been joined by Raja Jai Singh of Umbar. On the 14th May 1707, Azam Shah, after seventeen days of marching and one day's halt, reached Siranj, a distance of more than 114 coasts from Burhanpur. The suffering from heat and want of water had been very great and the Kharasiyas, or jungle tribes, plundered every man that they could lay hold upon. From Siranj, a force of some 4,500 men under Zulfikar Khan, Rao Dalpat Bundela, Rao Ram Singh, Ahmed Said Khan, Barha, and others were sent on to reinforce Bidar Bakht, who now advanced by his father's orders towards Gwalior. 
in order to seize the fords on the Chumbal River. At Siranj, Azam Shah heard that Muazim Shah had reached Lahore. From Siranj, Azam Shah hastened on to Gwalior, the sufferings from heat and bad water continuing to be most terrible. When he had reached Sarai Imak, 15 calls from Gwalior, two messengers arrived from Bidar Bakht's direction with information that Prince Muhammad Azim, second son of Muhammad Muazim, had already reached Agra and had sent on Mustashim Khan with 7,000 horse and a strong force of artillery to occupy the fords over the Chambal, while Muhammad Muazim, in person with his three sons, had entered Agra and taken possession of the fort. Much disturbed by this intelligence, the first that they had received of Muazim Shah's progress beyond Lahore, Azim Shah deposited the greater part of his baggage in Sarai Imak and made a forced march into Gwalior, which he reached on the 11th of June, 1707. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on coffee. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please click on the link available on our many social media platforms or email us. Why not donate to our coffee to show your appreciation? Every bit helps and we thank you for your continued support. We love that our listeners love listening to us. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by Saf Big. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and or night. And may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.